Acts chapter 19, it says here, and it happened while Apollos was at Corinth, that Paul, having passed through the upper regions, came to Ephesus, finding some disciples. Finding some disciples. How many know there's a difference between a believer and a disciple? Then he said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? So they said to him, we've not so much as heard whether there's a Holy Spirit. So he said, well, then what were you baptized? Into what then were you baptized? They said into John's baptism, which was water baptism. How many of you have been water baptized? You've been water baptized, right? So they were baptized in water. And then Paul said, listen, John indeed baptized with the baptism of repentance. Meaning if you've been baptized in water, you've repented. You said, I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. All things have passed away. All things have become new. He says he, he had a baptism of repentance saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after. That is Christ Jesus. And he said when they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them. Right. And they spoke with tongues and they prophesied. There's another baptism. How many know it's not just the baptism of water? How many know it's the baptism of the Holy Spirit? Holy Spirit. So this morning, I want to take a few moments to just talk to you on a little subject God gave me entitled, A Barrier-Breaking Believer. A Barrier-Breaking Believer. Before you're seated, tell your neighbor, you're a barrier breaker. Go ahead and be seated today. Barrier breaking believer. You know, I believe that a barrier breaking believer is someone that brings revival wherever they go. What we experienced yesterday was an example of how a church can bring revival wherever it goes. That when a people are committed to understanding that God has a plan and that his plan is the church, then that church can bring revival wherever it goes. We were in Philadelphia earlier in the summer and we brought revival there in Philadelphia. And the church is God's plan to bring revival. And the people of God are God's plan to bring revival. That's why when I think of this portion of scripture, it speaks so loudly to me because the book of Acts is not really the acts of man, but it's the acts of the Holy Spirit. And how many know that, you know, it, 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 we, we move, but it's the Holy Spirit moving through us that makes the impact. And when you look at this little portion of scripture, we read about Ephesus and the revival that broke out there. There was a revival that broke out really all through Asia, but it began somewhere. And how many know revival always begins somewhere? It begins in the heart of a man. It begins in a church and a group of people. And then revival and the fire begins to spread. And so we find that there was a revival that broke loose in the church of Ephesus. And then that fire began to spread through all of Asia. And there are a number of reasons why the, these group of people experienced revival. I, I got to tell you, man. As we close out this year, I feel this is such a necessary message for some of you because you started out on fire, but your fire is beginning to shrink. And I don't know about you, but I've got a conviction before God that every year I want to finish stronger than I started. That's a good, good crowd saying amen. amen. Tell your neighbor, let's finish strong. Some of us need revival. Some must need revival. The word revival means literally to come back to life. And so there was a revival that broke out in Ephesus. And there was a number of reasons why. Number one, you find that the disciples who were there, they received the power of the Holy Spirit. The disciples that were there received the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, the Bible tells us there were some disciples in the region. There were disciples there. Someone say there were disciples there. But what you find about these disciples is that they weren't making much of a difference. They weren't making much of a difference. You can be a disciple, but just because you're a disciple doesn't mean you're making much of a difference. Now, it wasn't that these disciples there were bad people. 
They, 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 they weren't bad people. It's just that they couldn't bring change. It wasn't that they weren't educated. It wasn't that they weren't good people. It wasn't that they didn't have their head screwed on right or they were great thinkers. They were all those things, but they were lacking the most important ingredient. They were lacking the power of the Holy Ghost. And that's a word for somebody this morning is that you can be a good guy, a good girl, but do you have the power of the Holy Spirit? Do you know how to pray? Do you know how to pull down the power of God in your situation? See, these were good people, good folk. I meet a lot of good folk in the church. I meet a lot of good folk, good family folk in the house of God, but they don't have the power of the Holy Spirit moving through their life. Oh, come on, somebody. So revival can't take place with just good people. Revival only takes place when there's a people that have been baptized in the Holy Spirit. God hasn't called us to be powerless disciples. He's called us to be powerful disciples. He's called us to move in the power of the Holy Ghost. See, to be powerless is to have a demand placed on you that you cannot meet. To be powerless. You know what it is to be powerless if you have teenagers and young people in your family. One of the most viable uh, instruments in your household is your phone charger. And that's why they steal your phone charger from your bedroom and they steal your phone charger from your car because they can't go a minute without their phone being charged. It's when their phone dies that something in their heart and in their life begins to die. So they need that phone charger because when they plug it in, that's when they come back to life. Well, it's the same thing. We're in a world with people that are struggling, dying, hurting. They're dying right before their very eyes. But they need to link up with some disciples that know how to pray. They need to link up with some disciples that have a word in their spirit. Come on, somebody. Maybe there's even a disciple here that God has used you to prophesy. So there was revival when the Holy Spirit fell on the disciples. The second reason there was revival is because they were not afraid to confront the false prophets. The false prophets were exposed. And I want to share something with you. If you want to see revival, you must have courage to confront things. You cannot change what you're unwilling to confront. You want revival in your home? Confront sin. You want change in your marriage? Confront the issues. Get to the bottom. Get to the root of the problem. How many know it takes courage to bring change? And the, they, these were men. Paul was a man who was not afraid to expose the wicked leadership that was leading people to destruction. I, I get so discouraged when I see people follow leaders that have no power. That instead of leading them to victory, they're leading them to defeat. You ain't saying nothing to me this morning. But revival breaks out. Come on, somebody. When we're not afraid to confront sin within our life. We're not afraid to confront false teaching and false doctrines and things that are leading people into a pit. I came to tell you, we've got some leaders here that know what it is to stand upon the word of God. Come on and give him praise. See. Revival flowed. Watch this. Revival flowed because Paul and the disciples were, were able to endure the fierce opposition that comes when you take a stand. See, we can shout on the confrontation, but can you stand when all hell breaks loose against you when you stand for righteousness? Come on, somebody. See, you want, people want a holy church, but they don't want to live holy. <laughs> They want things to get better, but when all hell breaks loose and they come against you for standing on the word and they come against you for standing for righteousness and they come against you for being good to your spouse and putting down the bottle and putting away the needle and putting down the, the crack pipe. Come on, somebody. All of a sudden, you don't want to stand no more. But if you want revival, you got to stand when the devil comes against you. You got to stand. Don't be a compromiser now. You won't see revival. Oh, this is good stuff right here. They overcame the attacks, the conspiracies, the opposition, and they didn't lose heart no matter what was coming against them. My sister, can you bring that phone down? We, we got our, yeah, can you put it down? Because we have it on YouTube, so, you know, it's hard for me to preach when I see that camera right there. It's distracting me. We got to stand. And you know what's amazing is that even though they were being attacked, they were being attacked, they didn't lose heart for the mission. 
There's a lot of Christians that, that they lose heart for the mission when the devil comes against them. And let me tell you something, man. When the devil comes against you, it's not because you're doing something wrong. It's because you're doing something right. Mm, come on now. You're doing something right. So you got to stand up. Someone say stand up. The third reason they experienced revival is because when they preached the word, the people were cut to the heart. The fear of God impacted the people for positive change. If you read a little bit further, they burned their superstitious scrolls and charms. They cast magic out of the region. They cast out demons. They cast out the cultic images. They cast out all these things. And what we find is that when they preach the word of God, this is the part I want you to hear is that the identity of the people move from Greek culture to kingdom culture. The identity of the people. This is where we take a self-examination. When you look in the mirror, who are you really? Are you Mexican? Are you black? Are you Indian? Are you a drug addict? Are you a gang member? Did you spend this many years in prison? Are you a child of the living God? See, when the word of God was preached, they moved from worldly thinking to godly thinking. Let me put it this way. When the word of God was preached, they moved from the code of the street to the word of God. And let me tell you something. You want to accomplish something spiritual by living by the code of the street. You live by the code of the street. Your loyalty is to the street. Your loyalty is to the world. Your loyalty is to your old neighborhood. Your, oil, your loyalty is to your grandma's old myths and tales. And I came to tell you, if your loyalty is to that, you'll never experience revival. It's when you let the word of God cut you to the heart and let the word of God bring new life and let the word of God change you. Come on, somebody. I want to hear some claps on that because we need some people to make a shift this morning. Your loyalty is not to your job. Your loyalty is not to your money. Your loyalty is not to politics. Your loyalty is to the word of the living God. And when you shift your loyalty, that's when revival can break out in your life. Woo, tell your neighbor, he's preaching good this morning. That's when revival will begin to flow. How many want to see revival? How many want to see revival? And then the last thing is that Paul, he, he, he was an impact leader. He was an impact leader. To see revival, we must have those who will not step down, but those who will rise up. To see revival, we must not have those who will stay in the cave. We need those that will come out of the cave. To have revival, you can't have people working in the shadows. You got to be willing to step up into the spotlight for a moment. To have revival, we can't have people that are stuck in a season. But they're able to recognize that that season is over and God is getting ready to do a new thing through their life. Paul was that man. Paul was that breakthrough person, that breakthrough leader. He, he took it personal. He opened up a school called the School of Tyrannus. He rented a building from a man by the name of Tyrannus. And he taught his disciples there for two years. And for five hours a day, he took them from worldly thinking to kingdom thinking. For five hours a day, two, for two consecutive years. Kind of sounds like the UTC or the MTC. <laughs> Pastor Barry's got his own school of Tyrannus. And for two years, five hours a day, he just shifted their mindset. It wasn't a place of reasoning. It was a place of impartation. It wasn't a place to debate the scripture. They could debate the scripture in the synagogue. Jesus preached in the synagogue. Paul preached in the synagogue. They wanted to get deep, go to the synagogue. But the minute you talk about the power of God, that's when the Jews kicked you out of the synagogue. Because the Jews and religious people, just like some of you, you don't believe in the power of God. You want the word, but it's the power of God that's going to bring revival. Come on, somebody. It's the power of God that's going to bring revival. 
And so for two years, five hours a day, he imparted about the power of God. That's where he wrote to the Corinthian church the letter. He says it was not by eloquent words or, or, or wisdom of man, but by a demonstration of the power of the Holy Spirit. They were laying hands on the sick. They were casting out demons. They were breaking chains of bondage. That's what we need coming out of victory outreach. We need leaders. We need leaders that aren't going to be regular Christians. We need leaders that aren't going to kick back and be conservative. Just come to church on Sunday. We need leaders that know what it is to be delivered and to move in the power of the Holy Ghost. Am I in the right church this morning? We need leaders. Watch this. That haven't just been dipped in water. We need leaders that have been dipped in oil. Yeah, right. We dip you in water and we say, go and take the city. The water ain't enough. We need leaders that aren't going to just be dipped in water. We need leaders that are going to be dipped in oil. We need leaders that are going to be dipped in the anointing of God. We need a church that's dipped in the power of the Holy Ghost. Come on, somebody. We need a church that has been dipped in oil. See, before revival can break out in a city and revival can break out, in, in a region, revival must first break out in you. Because if you're going to change, bring change and you've got to experience change in your own life. Let me tell you, ministry that doesn't change you doesn't change anybody else. Ministry that doesn't change you doesn't change every, anybody else. Prayer that doesn't change you doesn't change anybody else. Come on, somebody. But we need some leaders that are going to rise up and say, I recognize that there's a Holy Ghost that God wants to pour out and move through me. Oh, I'm preaching because I believe in this stuff. We need some leaders who've been dipped in oil. We need some leaders that have a living walk with God, not a dead walk. I've been telling you, we, you know, some of the ways some of us walk in the house of the Lord, you walk like serving God is so painful. Oh, God, what was me? It's so hard to serve God. Dude, who wants to follow that? Who wants to see who wants to follow that spirit? That's an anointing I don't want. I'll tell you something. It's not hard to serve Jesus. I love serving Jesus. I love doing the ministry. It wakes me up in the morning. It gets me on my way. I do it from the sunrise to the sunset. Squeeze in a nap. Get up and do it all over again. Because it was God that delivered me. It was God that changed me. It was God that saved me. Woo! We need some leaders in this church that you're alive. That you're not dead. That you're not falling asleep on me in the services with your eyes closed. Come on, somebody. We need some leaders in this place that are going to experience a personal revival before 2018 comes to an end. We need leaders who want to make an impact. You saw me yesterday, man. You think it's easy for me? You think it's easy for me? People were telling me, I said, oh, Pastor Al, you know, you, you, you know, look at you go. You're a networker. You're this. You're that. No, I'm not. <laughs> Talk to the mayor with such ease and these people with such ease. And do you know what I go through just to get to that place to be able to do it? But I recognize it's nothing I can do. It's only the Holy Spirit that is moving through my life. I'm just a kid that came from a broken family. I'm just a kid that grew up in poverty and divorce and despair and depression. But when the Holy Spirit got a hold of me, he changed me into a new man. I became a new creation in Christ Jesus. We need leaders that are going to bring life wherever you go. Not death, life. Not confusion, life. Not discouragement, life. We need leaders that are awake in the spirit. We need leaders that God can move through. Who have a living walk, who want to make an impact. If, if leaders don't experience revival, watch this. If people, believers, Christians don't experience revival, then you better believe that legion will continue to control your region. Jesus went to go cast out a demon. And they all screamed out like a choir, leave us alone. 
This man was so possessed, so demonically possessed, that he, he said, what's your name? He says, which one? <laughs> For there are many. <laughs> See, some of us come out of families like that. We come out of worlds like that. What, what's your curse in your family? What do you mean, which one? Alcoholism, drug addiction, abuse, the list goes on. It says, we are many. Call us legion. <laughs> We're a gang. We've been controlling this guy for a long time. We've been controlling this family for a long time. We've been controlling this neighborhood for a long time. We've been controlling these young people for a long time. But when a leader is filled with the Holy Ghost, when a, a man or a woman is filled with the Spirit of God, they step in and legion has got to go. Fear has got to go. Bondage has got to come on somebody. We need some leaders here that are going to be filled with the power of God. That when you go home, you look at that devil and say, boy, you got to go. You got to go. You got to go. See, we need breakthrough people. I believe that they're here. I believe that's why you come to church. You come to church so that you could be trained in how to bring breakthrough. How to experience breakthrough, bring breakthrough, and recognize that breakthrough is a reason God has called us. Very quickly, I think in order to be a, a breakthrough people, there's just two things. Number one, we need to recognize and really be honest about the barriers in our life. And, and number two, we need to renew our hearts in a prayer environment and also return to a breakthrough culture. Don't settle. Don't get comfortable. Don't try to keep up with the Joneses. Don't, don't try to be like everybody else. Let breakthrough continue in your life. Let breakthrough continue in your family. Someone say breakthrough. breakthrough. So the first thing is we have to recognize and admit the barriers. How many know there are barriers? There are barriers to the breakthrough. What, what's one of the barriers? Well, I think one of the barriers is going to be the spiritual barriers. Those spiritual barriers that happen when a person comes to the place of stagnant faith. Stagnant faith. I've been teaching you that either hot or cold, there's, there's no lukewarm Christians. There's no demilitarized zone. I, I believe it's the responsibility of every Christian to stay on fire for God. But sometimes we have Christians and believers that they fall into stagnant faith. They become stagnant in their walk with God, lifeless walk, their hunger for God is not growing. Even to get to a point where spiritual death begins to set in and where the word God has preached, it, it more repels them than draws them near. It's like going to eat, and, you, and if you just ate and then you go to a nice restaurant, you're not going to really enjoy that dinner. And some Christians are so full of the world, they can't enjoy the preaching of the word. They can't receive what they need for proper nourishment in their spiritual walk with God. And so we need to recognize those spiritual barriers in our life. What's kept our church growing and going throughout the years is that recognition of that barrier right there. Is whenever a leader has gotten stagnant, they've let the Spirit of God speak to them. Whenever a leader has become stale, they've gotten back into the place where revival can happen. That might be a word for someone right now, man, is that, is that you're, you're going through that right now and you need to get back to the place where revival can happen. So spiritual barriers are real. Spiritual barriers are real. What's another barrier that we have to overcome? I, I believe it's the mental and emotional barriers. You know, we've been learning that, 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 you know, the blood of Jesus saves us, but there are some important qualities needed in order to walk in his purpose and possess his will. How many of you want to possess his will? I've been teaching you that through the traits of the greats. I want to mention it again because it's important to break the mental and emotional barriers. So many Christians spend so much time building their brain, but they don't build their emotions. They achieve mental intelligence but they're not growing their emotional intelligence. 
You got some deep people that know the word that can't make it through the fire. <laughs> That's why you got these guys in prison preaching. Come on, somebody. Because they couldn't walk through the fire when they weren't in prison. Right? I'm telling the truth. They grew their mind, but they didn't grow their hearts. That's what drug addiction is. Drug addiction is when you can't grow your heart. So you self-medicate. I'm going too deep on you, aren't I? You can know the word and still drink from the bottle. You can know the word and still smoke a pipe. Come on, somebody. Smoke a little weed and say, the Lord made the... You ain't saying nothing to me right now. It's because they're so busy growing their mind, but they're not growing their emotions. And it's time for us to go to another level in our emotions. Oh, come on now. See, a renewed heart, I mean, a, a regenerate heart doesn't equal a renewed mind. That's why Paul says, let there be the renewing of your mind. So that you be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the good will of God is within your life. It's not what's coming out of your mouth. It's what's coming out of your emotions. It's not what's coming out of your mouth. It's what's coming out of your life. Well, this is too good right here, isn't it? If you agree with your pastor, come on and give him a big, big, give the Lord a big praise right now and get behind this. We want to raise up some breakthrough people. You should never have to go back to the world. You should never have to go back to addiction. You should never have to go back to abusive relationship. Don't you know that God wants to do a full work within your life? And when you grow your emotions and those mental barriers that try to stop you, that's when you're able to be a greater vessel for the glory of God. There's some of you right now that you need to learn to look beyond your weaknesses. Look beyond your weaknesses and start looking at your potential. You're not called to stay stuck in that area of your life. God wants to break you through. God wants to take you to another level. That's why I feel like this message is so good for this service, because some of us have been stuck too long. And this is the season where God says, I'm going to take you to another level. I'm going to raise you up to another level. You're not going to go back. You're going to go forward. And then what's the third, third barrier that, that we need to break? is the financial barriers, financial barriers. You know, I believe that if we want God to use us and if we're going to bring revival, we need to really begin to take a look at dominating and overcoming those financial barriers in our life. See, leaders who make a difference and bring revival demonstrate a powerful spirit of generosity, a powerful spirit of generosity. See, someone who doesn't give or isn't growing in their giving brings doubt to the vision. Someone who doesn't give or is not growing in their vision brings doubt to the vision, weakens the house of God, weakens the mission of Christ. You know, some people, they fight tooth and nail to tell you that you know, giving is not biblical when giving is spoken more about in the Bible from cover to cover than anything else. And they just want to wrestle with you about giving. But the reason they wrestle you with giving is because the reality is they're just not growing. They're just not growing. And I want to be the type of leader that is still growing in every area of my life. I, I want to grow in my vision. I want to grow in my character. I want to grow in overcoming the weaknesses that try to hold me down. But I also want to grow in my generosity. I want my life to be a powerful force of generosity. When you love something, you're not willing to give some of yourself. You're willing to give all of yourself to it. Right? And I'll tell you, when you begin to give financially, that's when God begins to bless you. Every person here, and I know I, I love preaching, because many of you, when I start talking about giving, you light up. I could see you. You're like, yes, come on, Pastor. I love when you talk about giving. Because you know why? The people that get excited are the ones that are already giving. And they've already set goals. And so they get excited, and, and it's good. And I'll tell you, but we need to continue to grow. We need to continue to grow. We're believing God that this church here 
is going to continue to impact this area of the city for a long time to come. We're believing that this church, your church, you, and not only you, but your children and your children's children will always have the lighthouse of Victory Outreach right here in the southeast of San Diego. But one thing that we recognize is that if we want to see revival take place here, and how many of you yesterday was like a little glimpse of that? That whole little wall, like it seems like such a small thing. But how did you feel this morning when you saw it? You're like, hey, well, you guys gave to that. Give yourselves a hand. You guys gave to that. You guys sewed into that. We're believing that we're going to continue to make an impact for years to come. We met with our architect um, just this week, and he's been working on our building expansion and, and pushing the wall back. And we've had to really do a lot in the sense of learning and preparing. And he told us, you know, we can push it back and you can get about 1,100 seats in here. He says, but I found out some good news. He says, I found out that you have enough parking if you'd like to go further back. And then I told him, I go, well, I, found, I got some better news. <laughs> I found 50 more parking slots. He goes, oh, then you can go even farther back. He says, wouldn't it be great if we built a sanctuary for 1,400 people right here in the hood? I get up here, man. I hear this music team worshiping the Lord. I see you coming in worshiping the Lord. I see chains falling off of you. I see a spirit of depression being broken, broken in you. What would happen if we push this wall back and many people who are broken and hurting would walk into this place and experience the touch of the Holy Ghost? What would happen if we begin to expand the army of this church from the leaders we have? We begin to double, we begin to triple, we begin to quadruple, and not only impact the city of San Diego, but impact other countries for the glory and honor of Jesus Christ? What am I saying to you this morning is if we want it to happen, we've got to be willing to be a channel that God can use in every area of our life. I, I want to tell you as I get ready to close, Matthew, you can come. I want to tell you right now that I refuse for my life to be meaningless. I refuse for my life to be meaningless. I refuse to be a survivor in this world. I know that he saved me with a purpose and he saved me with a destiny. And I'm looking for some people at Victory Outreach San Diego that will stand with their pastor and say, I'm not going to be an average believer. I'm not going to be a church going, a Sunday going Christian. I'm going to be the leader that God has called me to be. Feel with all of my heart that we are in a season right now where God is drawing a line in the sand. Look at your neighbor right there next to you. Tell him it's time to cross that line. <laughs> He's drawing a line in the sand. I, I listen, guys. This message came out of my week. I've been working this week. I've been working all year. Yesterday I was sitting down. I had got home from the outreach and. So it's great outreach and everybody was still fellowship. I said, I got to go home, man. I'm tired. And I sat there and, and I started to think about the year. Do you know what we've done this year? We started out the year by raising money for our, build, or for our building. We raised over $150,000. And then we had Pastor Sonny come, right? And then he said, knock down the wall, Legacy Weekend, all the churches came. It was like a conference. All the pastors were blessed. They're still talking about it. They said, when are we going to do it again? I said, give me a break, brother. Give me a couple <laughs> months. And then we went to the East Coast with Tim and the guys, Artie and Johnny. And oh, man, we went out there just for, for three days. We went out there for 11 days. And we ministered. And we began to reach these heroin addicts, these guys and girls that are hooked on fentanyl. And we saw a lot of death and destruction. And we helped the church. It went into double services. We came back burdened and, and, and just hearts exploding for the need in the East Coast. And then, you know, we come back. And then we have this outreach and all the other outreaches. And 
And sometimes we minimize that. And I always look for those leaders that when we're having these events that they're pressing in more, they're pulling back. See, the ones that are pulling back, they're not understanding how much of an impact their life makes. And I think about those things and I refuse. I refuse to live a life that is meaningless. How about you? What kind of life do you want to live? Do you want to be struggling with the same things all the time and always in your trials and always hurting? Oh, and always in need. need. And I, man, but, but I've had a little taste of that. And I said, I'm not going to live my life that way. Two years of that was enough. I said, man, God, you saved me and delivered me so that I could go right back into trials. Oh, no, 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 no. That's not the life I want to live. No way. I want my life to make an impact. How many of you agree? You say, I want my life to make an impact too. I want to make a difference. You can. You can. You can make a difference. But you've got to begin to break those barriers in your life. Some of you young people, you've got to make wise decisions with your life. Who are you going to marry? Oh, that's the most critical decision you're going to have to make. Next is serving the Lord. Who are you going to marry? I thank God that I have a wife that even though I'm not perfect, she supports every vision and dream that God has given me. And not just by saying, hey, honey, go for it. I'll be over here. No, she throws her life into it behind me and she gives her all. My kids, the same thing. She's followed me all over the place. Bridgeport, Connecticut, all the houses were burned down. It was ghetto. You know, I could say, right? right? This is not the ghetto. That's the ghetto, right, Alex? And we were in the ghetto, war-torn area, broke, came back home, went into UTC. You know how long we were in the UTC? 12 years. I was asking Chris how long he was there. He was there eight years, nine years, sacrificing there for those young people. We didn't go in just, you know, with a little commitment, a few months. And, you know, I'm not saying now it's different, but I'm just saying in anything you do, in anything you do, you don't go on with a few months and I'm going to try this out. That's why the church can't be powerful. We go in with everything. And you know what we need? We need leaders in our church that you're going to stop making excuses and you're going to go in with everything. Huh? Who agrees? Who agrees? And there's no greater life to live. There's no greater life to live. Like Louis, look at Louis. He's been doing it for years, years, decades. Him and his wife. No, I, I would say it with great respect. Joe and Lydia, Ganchi. There's no greater life to live than a life that pursues the plan of God. And when you do that, that's when God says, okay, now I can send a revival because I have the people in place where revival could flow. And what I want to do is I want to sing a song and I want to open this altar just for the people that say, I want God to pour out revival through me. I want God to use me as a channel of revival in my years on this earth that I refuse to live a meaningless life. I want to live for God and I want to make an impact for God. And if that's you, I want you to just come on down to this altar right now. I feel like there's a, a conference spirit here this morning.